Hey everybody, it's your buddy Tommy D, Tommy DeMesa. Welcome to what we're calling Philanthropy in Focus. I'm just so excited because this is a cool situation where I get to have just an open dialogue with one of my friends and then I share it with you guys. So what we try to do here on Philanthropy in Focus is highlight a nonprofit organization, specifically the leader of that organization, and have them talk to us really from the genesis of the organization straight through to the programming, the challenges, the needs, and, and what that organization is all about. So today, I am super excited. I have my friend, Beth Bachheister. Hey, Beth, how are you? Hi, Tommy. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks. And as I like to Great say, to see you. yeah, right on. I like to say, welcome to the attic, because that's sort of where I am. It's, uh, we're sitting here, it's April 23rd, 2020, and it's a new world. We're all living in a new world. And um, we'll probably get into some of that today. But by background, and I'm going to have you fill in a lot of the gaps for me, Beth, but uh, Beth is a life coach with a specific focus in the area of bereavement. And she is also the founder and executive director of Career Day Inc., which is a nonprofit organization that has for the last number of years been doing incredible work in high schools here on Long Island to expose young people to what vast opportunities there are from a career perspective. You know, it's there's so many things that people, I mean, we'll get into it in a second, but I think you've had a comedian at, at one of the career days, right? Obviously, you've had medical professionals and police officers and fire, uh, fire department folks. Um, but it's a, it, what I look at what you're doing there is empowering and highlighting, uh, empowering these students and highlighting careers that sometimes are, are more unique and off the grid that people don't know about. And I'm excited to get into that today. So what we're going to do today is just have an open dialogue. Beth's going to tell us the story of Career Day. She's going to tell us how she got there. And uh, I think we'll have some fun together. So, Beth, you ready for the ride? Great. Yep. Thanks, let's, Tom. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about sort of where, start wherever you like. You know, this is just kind of a conversation. If, you know, tell me a little bit about you, your background, and, and up into how we got to Career Day. Okay. Well, thanks, and thanks again for having me. It's a, it's a great nonprofit community of friends that we have and that have developed over these last few years, and I, I really appreciate it, and I appreciate your time this morning. So Career Day, Inc. was started really in, 2000, really in, in 2005, about two years after my husband, Ari, was killed. And in the middle of closing my business, in the middle of trying to manage my two teenage daughters, I thought, what else can I do? And we did a quick career day program at Oyster Bay High School where they went, and we started doing a scholarship. After my daughters graduated high school, I went on to other things, and I became a certified professional life coach. And um, my work focused on change of life issues, people stuck in moving towards their futures, and then ultimately with a focus on bereavement. Uh, in 2016, I thought, well, what was my best day since my husband passed away? And it was really Career Day. And so we started Career Day, Inc. as an organization to inspire high school students through career choice awareness, and also to continue my husband Ari's legacy in if you do something, do anything, just do it, and you'll be successful. And so there's a scholarship in Ari's name awarded to one student in each school who can indicate that the Career Day Inc. program has had an effect on their future education goals or training. And that's really been terrific. We've given a scholarship to a student who said she didn't think she was going to graduate high school and was motivated by a, a photographer. We've given scholarships to other students who um, during a, a problem during one of the uh, in, at one of the schools, she stopped a speaker on the front lawn, asked for her contact information, and she was an admissions counselor in a university, and she was the recipient of a scholarship. Oftentimes, we pick students who would have never received a scholarship otherwise. So, regardless of academic achievement, students are eligible for this award. We bring about. Depending on the size of the school, we bring about 50 to 75 speakers into each school. We take over the school for the whole day. It's an amazing program. We have a breakfast for the speakers. We have luncheons sometimes for the students and the speakers. And we really provide interaction between professionals and students in a way that they would have never had an opportunity before. A lot of times the teachers and the professionals say to us, 
you know, I wish I had this when I was in high school. Um, and the students really get to pick from a myriad of professions, whether it be trades, plumbing, electrician, um, or we've had Supreme Court justices, we've had uh, directors of hospitals, really things that I didn't know I could be a director of hospital with a degree in nursing, for example. This past week, we did our first virtual career day in Wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, we gotta stop there because- Program at Hicksville I, High School. Well, let amazing. me stop you, let and me stop you, Beth. I wanna understand that because I've been to one of your career days. That's just I, where my mind was going, Tom. Yeah, 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 I'm with you, I'm with you. I just wanna yeah. know, I wanna stop you because I wanted to, I wanna understand how that, the mechanics of that. I mean, I've been, I was out at West Hempstead, which was last fall. What yeah, was? December. December, okay. Um, and I was, it was fun for me because I was not a speaker and I got to go around from classroom to classroom and you were like, Tommy, go to this room or go check this out. And it was kind of fun that I got to see, because at, at 42 years old, um, I'm still evolving and still figuring out what my next career is going to be, right? I, I don't, I think that's who we are on these journeys is just people learning about different things. I mean, in all honesty, uh, these headphones and this microphone were in a box up until, you know, three, four weeks ago and had been there for about a year and never even opened. So, um, mm -hmm. so, so constantly evolving, but you and I had talked sort of behind the scenes. Um, this has always been an in-person event career day because yeah. what else, what else would it be? Right. It just made sense. So let's not now let's talk about that a little bit. You had to pivot. This seems to be a popular word. It's coming up in all my meetings these days. How have you had to pivot? How have you had to change? What have you had to do? So you had scheduled this past career day for uh, an in-person event in March, correct? April 3rd. Yes. April 3rd. We had 80 professionals coming to Hicksville. Okay. So obviously, and again, if people are not aware, we're recording this in, in the midst of uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, and we're here on Long Island, so sort of uh, right outside the epicenter, if not part of it. So we've obviously, things like that, events like that, all events have, have been postponed, if not canceled completely. So talk to me about how that, how did that all happen? Because I know as determined as you were, you wanted it so bad and you wanted to make it happen, not for you, for what it, for the impact that it makes for these children, right? Um, yeah. Although I know you get, I know you get a lot of good vibes out of it personally too. So how did you have to, how do you do that? How do you go from we have this whole thing in real life to we don't. Yeah, um, you know, it was a huge challenge. And honestly, we had to take a pause for a minute because I really thought, wow, with all the school has to deal with, do they really even want to entertain doing a virtual career day program? And guess what they did? And the speakers in, the, in with all they had to deal with, with what was going on in their personal lives, they also wanted to continue. Certain things we didn't get to do. We didn't get to have a luncheon for really in-person interactions. We didn't have our wonderful keynote speakers like Renee Flagler, the executive director of Girls Inc. and yourself, who was scheduled to, to be a keynote for the students. And at the same time, we had this information. The students had already registered, which is a great thing that we have. The students select the professions that they want to hear. So I took the data with the help of the principal, Ray Williams, terrific guy at, at Hicksville and his staff. And we said, okay, what were the most popular professions? Who of those professions are available? Let's set this up in a trial, a two-day program, and let's see what happens. So we were able to invite the students specifically and directly who would pick these professions as their first choices. So of course they were going to attend. Mm -hmm. Then we sent out a blast to the entire school, they did a, a phone blast and an email blast, posted it on social media to say, we haven't forgotten the importance of this inspirational program and career day is coming. So last week on two to separate days, Tuesday and Thursday, we had eight sessions. We had 11 speakers. Uh, we surveyed the students and the professionals and the teachers. We had 66 responses from students and their um impression of the program after overwhelmingly the fact. positive Th that, after that was the fact. Yeah. Okay. yeah we want to give data back to the school and we want to improve so we're able to say here are the things that people liked here are the programs and professionals that they found inspiring and you know our friend matt thompson who works for morgan stanley in, in finance 
that could be a pretty dry topic. Hmm. When I saw a student write, that guy was cool. I'm like, that's it. We got it. Shout out, you know? Matt. Yeah. Um, and um, it's just, it's, it's really terrific. So I spoke with the guidance director, uh, Effie R- R- Malides, and Raffalides, and uh, we're talking about doing it again um, because there's more professionals and there's more students who have selected other people. And so we may not be done with working with Hicksville this year in spite of all the trials and tribulations of getting the kids, you know, through their testing and everything. Our program is valued and it feels terrific. See, but that's awesome because we're, we're figuring out how to transition and make things happen even when things are on pause, as uh, as you said, as as the governor has used that word pause, but I I don't really think we we can be on pause. We're just doing it differently. It's like we've just kind of gone down a different path. I want to ask you this. I want to know. Yeah. What, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, please. I was going to say you 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 talked about about coaching and and my bereavement work. You know, you can never say. I, I, there's a lot of phrases that I don't like. And and one of the things is you can never say that's good that that happened, that you lost somebody. That would never, ever be an issue. And what you do learn to say is, well, because that happened, I was able to do this. So I lost my husband. My daughters were in high school. I had a business to run, and I couldn't do it without him. And so because that happened, I involved into a little bit of a different professional and and use some of the skills I had working in retail with him uh, and starting as an audiologist, you know, it's always helping and um, and created this. So not, of course, we'll never be over that tragedy of losing him. And because that happened, we were able to create this. I love that phrase, because that happened, we were able to, yeah, um, acknowledging the, the, the person and, and the loss but realizing that we we got to we can move forward and grow because that happened. I love that. I wrote it down. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow it. I give you credit because I always remember who gives me quotes. So I'm gonna give you credit when I use that one. Um, I'm curious to see. You said you had 11 different professions just this this month. Um, was that right? 11. 11 professionals. Eight professions. Eight professions. So, not just at this most recent, but at the other. Um, events you've done in in real time in real life in, in the physical form what has been either the most strange and i don't mean that in a negative way or the most unique or um the one that the kids were just like totally like taken by and go and not to not, not to knock any of these professions but i'm just what, what are the ones that sort of rise to you you know you told some stories about the impact you've made as as that young person reached out to the admissions counselor and and the photography where, where people are getting exposed to things that maybe in your regular life they don't see. What's the strange ones? What's the outliers that you've, that you've sort of seen? Are there any like that? Well, last week, uh, Annette West Hempstead, I don't know if you have an opportunity to meet, Catherine Chimney. So she's a young lady who is an Olympic sailor and also an engineer. And, she, and I was able to sit in on all the sessions this time, which I can't ordinarily do, um, during a regular program. And so she told the story from the inside of the sailboat that eight young people are working, living and working together to, to build and maintain and try out for the Olympics in 2024, hopefully. And at the same time, she has a degree in engineering. So everything that she learned in school, she applies to her passion of sailing. So students came to her program who were interested in what it's like to be a professional athlete and also what it was like to be an engineer. So it was really cool to see her tie it together. And in ordinary circumstances, the kids could have come up to Oak Cliff Sailing in Oyster Bay and seen the boats and and met with the other people that she worked with. And that's still an offer out there from her. Every professional who presented last week virtually gave their contact information, their emails, offer for continued support to the students and follow through. And that's another thing that leads to the scholarship. So that is for me, really inspiring that the professionals are willing to offer their time. And so Catherine is a really good example of, wait, what? She's an engineer and a sailor. Um, so Aren't I we all, though? You know, like, really cool. I think it is cool. And sorry to cut you off, but I, I, I tell you personally, like, I remember, you know, for the longest time, I would go around telling people, well, I'm a salesman. That's what I do. 
you know, I'm a salesman, you know, that's what I do. I do business development and sales. And in the last number of years, I, I've, my thoughts, I always put myself in a category where I wasn't necessarily a creative as, as people say, um, I was just this sales guy and limiting what a limiting belief. And I think a lot of times we have these limiting beliefs about ourselves. I can only speak for me, but I've had that where now I'm not just that sales guy. Now I'm, we're having this conversation and we're recording it. Maybe this, uh, maybe the, 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 our podcast here today falls on people who need this and want to learn more about different things. And, you know, um, that's my intention with it. So I do have a creative side. So you can be an engineer and a, a, a future Olympian in sailing and, uh, and maybe you write a book or a play. It's not one. I, I mean, I have four children, four little kids and they're downstairs now and it'd be awesome if they can stay downstairs for our whole conversation, but who knows? I mean, the, the door's locked, but that doesn't really stop a lot of things sometimes. But I try to instill in them that, man, you can just take different opportunities. It's not one thing. It's not just one, you're not running one race. I mean, my, my oldest came up to me the other day and she said, um, daddy, I'm, I'm buying a, an electric guitar. And I was like, that's so cool. She's 10. And she had some money from the holidays and she's going on Amazon. So I asked her last night, I said, when's the electric guitar going to be here? Because I have congas in the basement that in, in the last couple of weeks, I've started to mess around with the congas. And I, I, I joined this call every, uh, I told you about this when we were talking yesterday, I joined this call every um, day at one o'clock from one to two, this call, this virtual call um, where there's a house band and they do an incredible interview each day. Uh, we breathe, we meditate, and then all inside of 60 minutes, we get to recharge our batteries. And even that, having the band there, inspired me to, to say, I'm going to play with the drums again. So I think we, as 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 individuals, as humans, we have so much different, so many different interests, and and we should avoid. And and you mentioned the keynote, and that's that's really what I was going to speak about. You know, had we been able to do the keynote, it was really going to be like don't put yourself in, in one swim lane, as they say, don't put yourself in, in one box. Think you try stuff out, man, just try different things. Like, okay, so I tried that and I'm not really good at that, or I don't have any interest in doing that thing anymore, whatever that activity was or that hobby. Um, I, I mean, I, I see my, my wife just in, in, in what we're all going through right now, we're trying to, in, in a lot of ways, find ways to control a situation. Right. So she's been putting a patio together in the backyard, like ordered stone and laying sand. And, and it's it, it's something that she just doesn't she'll take chances on stuff like that. And that's inspiring to me. And I think w something big. And, and, I, and I thought that those whole themes that you and I talked about leading up to um, what was going to be that that day in real time. Um, I was just going to kind of go on to that, because I think the more I think about it, the more things I'm interested in that I Five years ago, I would have said, nah, no, nah, that's for me, not for me. And I will tell you, a lot of that comes from, from um, watching different thought leaders. And there's a guy called uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, and he's, he's kind of a big deal in, on social media. And he, um, he, he sort of says, like, you know, people are starting new careers at 50, 60, 70 years old. And that inspired the heck out of me because I'd caught myself up in this typecast mold that, like, I was that guy. But there's so much more out there, Beth, and there's so many more opportunities. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure you see, I see a lot of that in these students, you know, that that's what, that's what's coming yeah. to me. You give me so much to think about. And, you know, just last week we had a woman who is the principal <laughs> of a special education middle senior high school in the Bronx. She came from the Midwest. She's of a Latina background. She was headed to law school and decided to do a master's and then another master's and she ended up in this incredible career with you know hundreds of students depending on her and uh, in the law panel this was great uh, a fellow michael shepard who i know since i'm a young girl from camp and he was a lawyer and he decided you know what law is not for me i'm going to go into real estate so he took those skills of what he knew about being a lawyer and and parlayed it into a really great career in real estate because so many skills that we all have overlap into different careers. And so two other things I want to say that I, you brought up when you were speaking was that's the thing about Ari scholarship. 
that it's not dependent on academic achievement. It's not dependent on how good of an athlete you are or a musician or an artist. It's dependent on that you've got inspiration from our program. So when we reach out to the schools, Hicksville had over 16, has over 1,600 students in their school. I want the kid who sits in the back of the room who thinks this is nothing is for me to know that this program is for them too. That's really, really important to me. And when I reflect on Ari, um, his parents were Holocaust survivors. He was born in Israel. He came here at 11, right after the Six-Day War, uh, which had already been planned, but they came for a better life to the United States. His parents were sure that he would be no academic. He became a hockey player. He'd never seen ice before being 11, never seen an ice rink. He was the captain of his high school team. They won the state championship. Very typical of him. Then in college, med school really wasn't for him. You know, everybody wants their son to be a doctor. So he became a PhD chemist because, you know, what do you do? You don't just stop there. You have to keep going. He didn't have well, a, there was no thing. He just pushed. He just pushed. That was his deal. Yeah. Well, yeah. And so chemistry was great, except it wasn't his own business. And he wanted to create his own destiny. So we ended up buying my parents' clothing store in Brooklyn. I was an audiologist. We ended up working together at the store. And standing in the store wasn't enough for him either. So he had to build some buildings. So we had a parking lot behind the store. He took some guys standing on the corner, literally put down your bud 40s and come and help me build this building. Six apartments, three stories. <laughs> and he built a building, you know, um, and that's just was him. He just, you know, just kept going and going and trying different things. If the car broke down, we pull over on the side of the road and he figured out how to fix it. Um, and, you know, maybe that's the genes of engineering that uh, my nephew got, who has also been a presenter, Sam Burlingame. So what's my point in telling you this story? It's just to keep trying, just to keep going. If it's not one thing, it'll be another, as long as you put your heart and soul into it. And, um, and, and that's what Ari certainly did. And, and that's what we try to motivate students to do. And gratitude is the students get it. And the professionals who come say, you know what, this really helped me get back in touch with how I got to where I am, what path I took to, to reach my goals. And, and thanks for getting me back in touch. A hospital administrator who was a nurse said, oh, now I remember how I got here, what, why I went into health professions. And um, it's really great to see, it really is. First of all, I appreciate you sharing the Ari stories because uh, it seems like just an incredible person. And um, insp I'm inspired. I wrote down hashtag inspired um, because I am. I feel that way because um, stories like that change people's stars. They really do. And and you just hearing you tell me that now affected me, and I'll I'll take that with me as I go into other conversations. Thank yeah, thank you for sharing it. Um, so these folks, you know. We've had a lot of time for re for reflection right now, um, as business owners, as individuals, as organizations, as families. Um, and personally, I've I've had a lot of reflection time, and I, you know, I look at what you're saying is how these professionals were affected by this, but by the experience of Career Day, and I I know this for a fact. We all get caught up in these rhythms and routines and we go to these places and we do these things because well that's what I've been doing for a year or two years or five years or ten without and I'll speak for myself but I think it affects a lot of people without remembering the basics of why do I do this again like what is the what is the mission what is the drive of, of why I do that for adult people to have that experience at your at your sessions there that's incredible like that's, you're affecting, you know, you're affecting the lives of these students without a doubt. You you have, I'm sure, hundreds of great stories about, you know, the letters they send you and, and what and how it's affected them and changed the trajectory of their lives. But how about, how about that? What you said there, these other people are plugging in and volunteering and giving of their time and they get something out of it. That's cool, man. That's just a really cool scene that they that now they're better for having done the event. Um, I, I would imagine it's is it difficult to find people to 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 volunteer and step into that role? I'm smiling because I knew you were going to ask that as you were talking, and at my initial meetings with the schools, because this requires definitely collaboration with the schools, 
And at my initial meetings at the schools, they always ask that question, how do you get the speakers? And you know what? I always say, that's not the hard part. That's not the hard part. It's unbelievable. And, you know, our friend Vikram, his, I, I'm going to get a little choked up. His wife is an emergency room doctor, separated from her family because of the coronavirus, hasn't been home for 32 days. And I, when I sent out an invite to the presenters who had registered saying, are you available to do a virtual program? I followed up with her and I said, I'm so sorry that I sent that to you because obviously you have so many other things going on right now. I couldn't expect you to take the time. And she wrote me back. She said, I'm off Friday. How about if you're going to do an extra day, I'll, I'll come on Friday. I was floored. The, the offer of people wanting to help inspire young students and tell their story is just mind-blowing. And that's a perfect example. That is a perfect example, and I appreciate sharing it. Um, sending my love out to Vic and his family. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Um, it's, uh, it's inspiring listening to these stories. Um, I, I want to understand, and, and nobody better than somebody who's on the front lines uh, like Vic's wife to, to tell that story these days, right? Because it does truly let us know what, it, what it's like, what the experiences those folks are going through. So um, what, if, if people are not or if it's not difficult to get volunteers to get involved with the organization from a speaker's perspective, um, what are some of the challenges? That I, I try to focus, I think the platform I'm, I'm looking to give organizations like yours on, on these video calls is really an opportunity to, yes, share the mission, but also who could you potentially look to collaborate with and what are some of the challenges, you know, whether it was pre, uh, let's say, what were your, some of your challenges in December of last year? And then what are some of your challenges now? Um, and, and maybe we can incorporate that into as well as who are some of the collaborative partners, whether they be for-profit or not-for-profit, um, and some of the needs. I'm giving you a lot of questions in one, but I think, you know, it's going to be a, a summarize really what, what I'm looking to get to with you, Beth. Yeah. Um, thanks. That, you know, and I do really appreciate you having me have this platform available uh, to to talk about Career Day Inc. and also to talk about you know the successes as well as the challenges. So I don't want to make it sound like it's so easy to get professionals that I don't need help with that. Uh, LinkedIn has been fantastic in friends of friends and all that, and and also we use a lot of alumni bases and contacts from the school. So so that's an important thing. I, I none of this you can do alone. You know that collaboration, connections, networking. You have given me so many wonderful people. So that's the the getting the professionals part. It's nice to get people from the community where the schools are. The difficulty, the two difficulties that I have really are introductions to schools, having schools understand who we are and what we do. Sometimes schools will say, oh, we do that. Uh, and then when I do a program and I spoke to Effie, the chair of guidance yesterday at Hicksville said to me, they're doing it, but not like you. So to explain to schools really the breadth of our program and what we bring and how we help them take this one thing off their plates because the schools are so overwhelmed with providing services to students. So. So that's one of the challenges. And the other challenge is like every nonprofit is financial. Um, at the moment, it's a one, two, three man show. Um, I would love to grow my board with some other supporters and people who really understand and appreciate the mission. And I would love to see uh, a little bit more financial sponsorship. We've had some really good people, Serenian and Associates, Investors Bank, um, help us financially and some private fundraising, small donations, as you know, add up. And um, I think that would really be my goals for next year, having introductions to more schools uh, and, and a more financial support and, and growing the board. So maybe three things. So I think that's every young nonprofit's challenge. And I think certainly the momentum was there when everything came to a halt in, in March, and look, we're still moving forward. So I'm not discouraged at all. I'm encouraged by the support and the friendship and, and colleagues that we meet all the time, 
And I think I've answered the question, you know, it's, you, you it's have, a typical yeah. challenge. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is typical. But um, that being said, I think it's important to hear it because um, my goal is that the people who watch this and, and engage with what we're doing here are going to say, oh, wow, that's an incredible program. And then 15 minutes into the discussion, they see, oh, and she's looking for board members. Oh, I'd love to serve on a board like for an organization like that. Or um, if it's a, a, a guidance, uh, director of guidance at a school here up on the North Shore, maybe North Shore School Districts, and they would raise their hand and go, we'd love to have you, you come in and do this. So, um, so that's, the, that's my focus is, is awareness on, on all these different things. So from a fundraising perspective, um, is there, you know, a lot of organizations, large and small, have the traditional gala, have the, um, you know, maybe the run, the walk, the rock, walk run, the, you know, what, is there any of that um, historically, or is there, any, is there any of that in your future to, that you want to do things like that? So we have not done that yet. And honestly, at this time, I have a little bit of a hesitation, a little bit of a fear about people are hungry, people don't have jobs. You know, there's so much being pulled at organizations who do have a large financial base, like our friends at the banks. And I, I'm taking a breath on that mm -hmm. a little bit, Tom. I envision a lovely gathering, a cocktail party in the backyard or at a local friend's restaurant where we can just come together and say, would you like to support us financially? Would you like to be a speaker? Would you like to be on the board? That's something I've always envisioned. Renee Flagler, Girl Inc., my dear friend, and I have talked about that for a little while. And it's something we'll revisit in the fall. I think, I think that's where that belongs. You know, I think yeah. right now there's a pause for medical and, and health needs that I really want to respect. I think that's great. Yeah. And, and, I, and I would agree with you. Um, and I, I see things like I see a vision. I see that cocktail party. I, I, that's cool. It's on brand. It's, it's, it's not, you know, the, the big hall, but you bring people together and they meet and they network and they understand each other and they understand what the organization is all about. And you're going to be able to, you know, not that everything's about quotas and numbers, but you're going to be able to pick off, you know, some financial support, some potential board members, and some schools. Some people are going to, like, I will say this, I don't have, I shouldn't say I have no influence, but I, I would imagine I have very little influence in the district where my kids go to school. That's only because I haven't really connected with the people that would make the decisions for what it is you're looking to bring to the schools. Probably because it's not as relevant because my oldest is in fifth grade. Um, and we're not at the high school level yet. That being said, in uh, I'm sure we could introduce this in my community and other communities, but that's, you know, this isn't about me just sitting here making connections on the fly. It's, you know, but that's where my mind starts to race. So I sort of talk about a pause. I have to put me on pause sometimes, Beth, you know? Well, you know, we're in a young organization. So we've only been a 501c3 nonprofit for two years, less than two years. Being registered with Nassau BOCES has been a really great help. We're a registered program with Nassau BOCES Arts and Education Exploratory Enrichment. And I love the segue of that um, because this is exploratory enrichment. And so that has really helped because we're registered with BOCES. It's an easy transition for the schools. And that's new. That's only this past academic year. So I'm encouraged, very encouraged by that and the accessibility to schools because of that. And when we finish a program, like at West Hampstead, and the principal, James D. Tommaso, says to me, you tell everybody to call me because this was great, and we're going to do it again. Uh, I envision doing programs at schools repetitively every other year because we do it mostly for the whole school. So the 11th and 12th graders will have moved out. The 9th and 10th graders who were young and maybe didn't have the ability to take full advantage of what was being said to them are now the senior, you know, the upperclassmen students, and so I envision that if we're going to repeat a school, it's going to be an every other year process. And that's been supported by the school. So I was on the phone with Mr. DiTomaso this morning talking about the scholarship winners. And he's like, okay, well, you know, get back on track for, for when we're going to do this again. And it's terrific. It's really very, very nice and supportive. So, so it is interesting. Something just came up for me with that. So it is available when you do a program from freshmen through seniors. All four grade levels can plug into to the day. 
it really works best like that, uh, Tommy, because how do you take a student out of a class? You know, not all ninth graders only take ninth grade classes. Not all mm -hmm. 11th graders don't take 12th grade and 10th grade classes. So because there's so much of an overlap of academics in the schools, it's really best if we can attract the whole school and if we're going to disrupt the school, we might as well do it for everybody. What we also offer is a shortened program, which had been on the calendar at South Valley Stream this year before the schools closed to do an assembly program. And the assembly program is a panel like, you know, live at the theater, live at the movies when you have a moderator, which would be myself and a few panelists talking about a segment. So we had planned to do for the 10th graders at, at South Valley Stream a program of employer versus employee, new careers versus the tried and true, and give students just a small taste of what's out there with a panel of four professionals. And I still hope to be able to achieve it virtually. We're working on it. And I'm excited that we can offer a shortened program for schools that want to do something for a specific grade. I think, you know, I like that other offering because some of this might be too much heavy lifting for a specific district or a specific school um, to give them some sort of smaller taste of what career day can do, I think is great. It's a, maybe in some cases I'm hearing it as almost like an introductory level. You know, if, you're, mm -hmm. if they can't, they're just like, can't do it. We don't have the bandwidth and maybe, you know, I have to look back at my notes because I want to make sure because this happened, because of COVID-19 and the coronavirus, we've had the opportunity and, and I, just what we're, this conversation and me recording this as a podcast is a, a benefit if that I could say such a thing, but because of COVID-19, I've launched the podcast. Because of this whole thing, I wonder if now you can that it's less work maybe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's less work to do this virtually. Uh, it's less wrangling of human beings together to do this virtually. So I, I'm getting to a question where, can you do more of those sort of like you had planned at South Valley Stream, like the shortened assembly style program? Um, and is it your intention uh, in, in 2020 to do more of those type of events? Yeah, I, I think that will be a, a whole new arm, as Ray Williams and Hicksville called it, another arm of Career Day, to be able to offer these virtual programs even when schools are back uh, in a physical setting. You know, I love the touchy-feely. I love making a luncheon for the professionals to network and, and interact with one another. That's, that's me. And I love this new opportunity that uh, Effie said to me yesterday, oh, we could do it in the little theater and we can have a whole segment of a grade come in and hear this panel. That sounds great. So a lot is going to evolve and there's a lot of opportunity. And what, what thrills me about it, honestly, Tommy, is that this is an offering that can only help schools. It, it might seem at first like, oh, you're going to bring in a strange program? Who are you and what are you going to do? And I know from our experiences, from our evolution, that this is only helpful for schools. This is another segment that somebody can come in and do something that they need to do and are stretched so thin oftentimes that it's great to have an organization that can come in and do it for them and, as they say, for their students. And, and another thing that I didn't bring up was how it supports the academics. When you are teaching an engineering class or a chemistry class, or anything that the students say, what do I need this? Even English. And you have someone like Renee come in and say, well, I'm also a published author. And there's the importance of English. Or um, I, I think it was the lawyers that were talking about the importance of writing skills and being able to be expressive that they learned from their English classes in high school. So the academics are supported by the professionals that come in, and that's terrific. And you know what? The artist talked about the importance of math, because in order to create your own business, you have to understand economics. And so this young gal who's an artist who did this huge mural behind uh, Broadway Mall in Hicksville talked about how in order to know what to charge, in order to be able to keep her own books, she had to be good at math, and she had to study math. 
And so maybe sometimes kids who are taking our classes think they shouldn't pay attention in math or don't need the math, and he or she was supportive of it. So I love that the program supports academics as well. I think that's a great one there, too, because, you know, I remember a lot of times, what am I going to do with this? Why do I have to learn this? Like, what do you, and, you know, as an, as an older person now, I, I look back and I go, I don't know what I'm going to be doing in five years, man. Like, there's so many different opportunities, right? So I may mm -hmm. use some of that stuff. Uh, well, we're in Long Island, so you can hear the Long Island Railroad coming by. Um, yeah. um, I, I remember when we first bought this house, uh, <laughs> I, I'm a block away from the railroad and the, the salesman, and I'm a sales guy, so I sort of have a soft place in my heart for salespeople. But he said, oh, yeah, yeah, the train never runs through here. You never hear the train, you know. <laughs> I won't mention his name, but um, but I always thought that was a funny thing. I don't know if he had had to deal with the railroad and, and made sure they didn't show up for the 45 minutes we came to look at the house or whatever, but... Um, Tom, I grew up with my grandparents living on 88th Street and Roosevelt Avenue in Jackson Heights. Sure. And they had a corner apartment. And every time I talked to my grandmother, she'd say, hold on, the train is going by. Oh, that's a tough <laughs> place. Make me really right by the Right by <laughs> City Field, Shea Stadium, right? Let's go Mets. Seven, yep. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, it's just, you know, and, and then I, I, I know if I, when I complain about the train situation, you can't go anywhere on this island and actually not be near the train. It just, which is, I guess, a benefit. It's great, you know, but not if you're trying to sleep. There's one, and then I'll get off this train subject, but there's one man. Um, I don't like him. I've never met him before, but um, right around 447 in the morning, he decides he, when he's coming through the neighborhood to just like pull down on that horn, really. And I think, I don't think he doesn't like me because he doesn't know me, but I feel like sometimes he's just trying to annoy me specifically. Um, I won't say any bad words on the podcast. It's kind of one of my rules here, but I don't like him so much. I'll just say that back. <laughs> just go back and watch that segment of my cousin Vinny. <laughs> yeah, I remember with the train. Yeah. Well, then he says, what does he say? He goes back to prison. He gets, a, he says, I'm going to hold you in contempt, the judge. And he keeps, he goes, you know what? I'm going to go. I might get a good night's sleep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great movie. We were talking about that a couple of weeks ago, you and me and, and Jonathan, right? Yeah, it's very good. Very good stuff. Um, that piece there where you talk about people, um, that it supports the academics. What a, what a great takeaway too. Um, yeah, this isn't just some, some extracurricular bonus thing over here. It's actually uh, justifying the need for the, why they're doing certain things. You talk about an artist who, who does a mural and, and she is keeping her own books because if she wasn't, she'd have to, if she didn't learn that, that skill set she'd have to hire somebody else. And that gets away from you as, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, you want to sort of be able, you may not want to live in each of these disciplines every day, but you want to be aware of them so you can hold people accountable. I mean, how many of those horror stories have we heard, just one sec, have we heard about, you know, the, the artist, the famous, the celebrity who loses millions or tens of millions of dollars because their business manager extorted them or, or was unscrupulous in some way. So, um, we have to own that. We have to be responsible of our, of our, uh, of, of be knowledgeable about these different responsibilities. It's God, Beth, you were going to say something. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I'll give, I'll tell you her name. His name is Marie St. Saint Cyr. Saint and what I never realized was she had to price the mural by the square foot. So she, whether she was charging a dollar or a dollar fifty or two dollars a square foot, and the mural was supposed to be 10 feet by 50 feet and she got there and it was 20 by 100 what's your fee now she had to do the math instantly so that kind of blew my mind I never thought about what was required in that sure I know that plumbers and electricians need math uh, but I, that was a really a, a great kick a real a real good surprise for the students to say you know what and you know what our friend Kellyanne Serini mm -hmm. also was a presenter last week and she's a fashion designer she also needs math. She needs math to know how much to charge for her goods. She needs math to know how much fabric is needed, uh, how much each piece is going to require, and then how to, you know, bring that out into the multiples of dozens that they create. It's, um, it's a really good support for people to understand in fields that maybe aren't traditional, you know, technical fields that you need those skills too. And I think supporting classroom curriculum is a, a really good bonus for the teachers. 
Yeah, what a great marriage and of, of the curriculum and the extracurricular stuff. I, I think that's awesome. Um, I know Marie, we've met, I, I think it's Marie that we've met. She's come to some of our roundtables. Isn't she involved with Westbury Arts or something like that? One of yes. those agencies? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. She had come to one or two of our nonprofit roundtables. Um, I, I will, you know, I'm going to make sure that at least four people other than you and I watch this podcast, which will be the four small humans that are downstairs right now, because th you. some of them come to me and say, what about this math thing? Why do I need to know about math? Why do I need to focus on math when I'm going to be a singer? <laughs> so um, I will show yes, them this Ari video. Would Ari would tell the girls, why do you need math? If that blouse is on sale 25% off. How much do you have to pay? <laughs> yeah, fortunately, you know, they can't go shopping right now. So at least that that part of the budget is under wraps because they can, uh, mm -hmm. can't go shopping, at least not. Well, they're going virtual shopping. I will tell you this. I don't know about your house, but there are a lot of boxes that show up on my porch every at the last couple of weeks. So Target. Yeah, God bless the Amazon, Amazon delivery. People. Yeah. They, you know what? Talk about it. They, those folks are out there um, every day, every day, every Sundays, even, you know, you see them delivering on Sundays. So um, well. I don't know if it's a thing we do here, but let's do it. Shout out to Amazon delivery people. We appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, um, all of them. All, the all of them. Everybody. There's so many people on the front lines that, that um, you know, that are not just your medical professionals. A couple of weeks ago, sort of when we first started doing these recordings, um, I interviewed uh, my friend Mark Bosha and his son Mark Jr. Uh, for a project they've been working on called Food for the Fearless. So they, um, Mark Sr. owns... It's one of the owners of the restaurant group of Bourbon Street, One Station Plaza, and Austin's Ale House, uh, three Queens-based uh, restaurants. And they've been raising, and at last check, I looked last night, they've raised $80,000 so far uh, through a GoFundMe page where for every $10 they raise, um, that's a meal that they bring to frontline uh, essential workers. Originally it was the hospital folks, but I've seen them do some work now. Uh, with the police departments, uh, precincts, and things like that. So um, people are doing such incredible things, Beth. There's so many great stories out there for the work that for-profits and non-profits are doing uh, in this time of crisis. So, um, well, for every segment of the for every segment of the economy that we can keep going, it'll keep another segment going. So you interrelated, I mean? right? I, I I'm very aware so, of what you mean. Yeah. So interrelated. And, you know, yesterday, I, I try to walk every morning now, and yesterday came to my mind One World. I love to take people who are visiting to One World in Manhattan and go up in the elevator and see that great evolution of New York landscape. And what about those people? What about the people who take the tickets, the people who manage the elevator, the people who work upstairs at the gift shops and the restaurants? There's not one segment of our community, of our, of our edu a culture, that hasn't been affected. So I'm not saying we all don't have to try to save money now and be cautious and all that. What I'm saying is, is that one benefit is a benefit to all. And that's another big thing about, you know, even just back to career day and giving that one scholarship. If we can change one person's life, we can make a difference for so many. You know, you know me and you know how focused I am on this sector in trying to make whatever impact I might be able to make and, and bring people together. But it's only because of what you just said. It's the, like, I learned, and then I don't know if it was a result of becoming a father. Um, I'm not real sure. I, I realized that we're here for, for really only a couple of reasons. It's really to love each other and help each other, man. And like, that's kind of it for, for like, so what, if that means in our business, we're in the employee benefits business. So we sell and service health insurance, but we do it in a major focus on nonprofits. If that's our, if that's what we're doing and we're doing a good job and making an impact, I'm excited about it then, right? But I, I think that whole deal is how do you make an impact? One benefit is a benefit for all. Of course it is, man. What's that story about? The one, um, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Little boys walking down the beach and there's a starfish all over the beach and he's picking up the starfish, but millions sounds a lot. So let's say there's hundreds and hundreds of starfish and he picks up the starfish and he throws it back into the ocean because they were stranded out there. And his father says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm, I'm throwing them back in. I want to save that starfish. And he says, uh, the father says, well, how can you, how, you're not making an impact. You know, you're, how, how can you help? There's so many, you're not going to be able to, and so he picks up another starfish and throws it into the water. And he says, made a difference for that one. <laughs> right? Made a difference for that one. Yeah. Yep. 
and there's so much of that going on now that aside from all the negative and political and partisan things that are going on there's so much good that's going on in the world from organizations and that's um that happens all the time but i mean i've seen even more of it now um and i appreciate the impact that that you're making and and i appreciate you coming on the show and having some fun with me today. it wasn't as fun it was terrific and you know I, I told you that I know your profession, you're a professional networker, <laughs> and the, the fact that you bring so many people together and enhance everybody's lives just, you know, from the people you introduce is just a fantastic thing. And, you know, I just say again, losing Ari was a huge impact on my family and, and our friends, and and so continuing his legacy, my two daughters are both in their 30s now, my older daughter Heidi's a social worker very interested in helping people who have struggled with addictions. And my younger daughter works in public relations, which people think, oh, that's a business business. And she found her way into the healthcare business and she feels very confident that the company she helps represent is gonna be one to cure a, a particular type of cancer. So when I bring these programs to students and I say the Ari Buchheister Memorial Scholarship is about how we affected your life. That's really what I mean, to continue that legacy of hope, of work ethics, and, and trying no matter who you are or where you come from, it is really what it's all about. And, and, and thank you for introducing me to so many people and having me uh, share this platform this morning. Uh, it means a great deal to me. Thanks, Tommy. And thanks for being here with me. I'm, I'm always looking to have fun and make an impact. And um, thanks for the kind words. and. Um, if what I do by making some introductions improve somebody's situation, I'm just I'm just thrilled and jazzed that it happened. That's that's kind of it. That's what drives me. And if my mortgage bank accepted all that juice that I get from it, I'd be better <laughs> off for it, you know. Um, so I, I want to close with this, Beth. Tell me how do people find out more about Career Day Inc.? How do they find out more about the Ari Buckheister Scholarship? How do they connect with you? What's the platforms and social and everything like that? As you know, I am so accessible. So the website is simply careerdayinc.org. Uh, my email is simply beth at careerdayinc.org. My cell phone number is on both, so you can reach me anytime. And there is a link for more information on the website. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, uh, both personally and professionally. So. I'm very accessible and very happy to talk to anybody who's interested in knowing more about Career Day Inc. Well, thank you again, Beth, for being here. I appreciate you joining the show. Everybody, this is your boy, Tommy D, Philanthropy in Focus. Um, and we'll see you on the next episode. Beth, thanks for being here. Have a great day. Talk thanks, to you soon. Tommy. See you later. Bye. Bye.